If I could have your attention, we would like to get started, please. My name is Bob Mitchell. I am the superintendent of schools, and I, I want to welcome you all to this uh, town hall meeting on school safety. We felt, in light of the recent incident that happened in Parkland, Florida, we felt that it was really important that we have this uh, town hall meeting so that we could share with with parents and community members um, the many things that we do in our schools to keep our students and staff safe. So I think those of you that look around, you can see that we have lots of town officials here. We have lots of school officials. And we also have um, moms and dads and people who are really interested in learning more about this issue. So thank you all for coming. We have some information that we want to share with you. But we would also like this to be interactive. I'm sure that there are folks that have some questions. There may even be some folks that have some ideas about uh, what we can do to um, improve school safety in the district. And I, th I do think it's important for everyone to know that, and I hope you understand this, that you know we, we're going to share with you some of the things we do to keep everybody safe. But we need to be careful about how much information we share because um, we don't want to provide any information that anyone could use in a negative way. So I just wanted to let you all know that. So the first thing I'd like to do is, is introduce uh, Mayor Bill Mary. Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Bob. And uh, good evening, everyone. And thanks for taking the time to come out. Um, we're very confident, not overconfident, but very confident of the communications that we have. And we want to relay that to the parents, the students, uh, the officials, the principals. I know we have a few uh, teachers and principals that are here that I believe uh, through the communication and working together with the superintendent and his staff and Dr. Matheson, I have our police chief, uh, John Damaris is here. Uh, we have our rescue. Uh, Joe is, uh, is here uh, from rescue. One of the things as the mayor is that I am the commissioner of public safety. And we take it very serious, not only under this kind of scene of problems that are happening, we do this on a regular basis of getting together and making sure that we are conscious of what's going on for the safety of all residents in Cumberland. So I can assure you, just standing here, again, as the mayor, uh, that we're on top of things. Uh, we're, you'll hear about a few things that we're doing. Uh, we've had active uh, uh, gun training in, in about four of them now uh, through the schools. Uh, we have other programs that we're working. We're listening, by the way, to other sources as things develop as we go along. So we got our ears open to everything that's going on, and we will focus on, again, the safety of our students and our residents uh, here in Cumberland. So I do appreciate your interest, and I hope you have some good questions. We'll try to answer anything we can. And again, just be assured that as a town, we are working together with everyone that's involved in this, and we take this very serious. So uh, thank you for coming. Thank you, Mayor. And, and I do think it's um, important to emphasize that, I mean, certainly awareness is raised for all of us as a result of what happened um, in Florida recently. And have we had more meetings as of late to, you know, be sure that um, we are um, on top of everything and ready to respond in the event that there is um, some sort of an incident. So we have had several meetings, but I think the important thing that everyone needs to know is we meet um, on an ongoing basis, and you're gonna hear about that tonight because we do have a district safety committee. Uh, Dr. Jason Masterson um, is the chair of that committee we meet on a regular basis and, and we'll talk about some of the things that we discuss and learn from one another during those meetings. So there really are three goals uh, this evening. One 
is to share with all of you the work that we're doing right now to keep students and staff safe. And we do a lot. And we practice a lot. We uh, want to talk about some of the things that we have planned for the future that we hope we can do to make it even better. And we also want to provide an opportunity. I'm sure that you all are going to have um, some questions. We want to provide you all with an opportunity to ask some questions and, and uh, offer some uh, public comment. So what I'd like to do now is introduce you to Dr. Masterson. Dr. Masterson, as many of you know, is the principal of McCourt Middle School. He has been the chair of the District Safety Committee for several years. Uh, I, I know that, you know, I'm a, attend the, the, the meetings regularly, and I think we have at least four of those meetings every year, and we meet uh, on a more frequent basis uh, if need be. So with that, and uh, Dr. Masterson will walk you through some of the slides that we have for you this evening. Let me introduce Dr. Jason Masterson, the principal of McCourt Middle School. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Mitchell, and all elected officials who are present uh, supporting our work. Uh, tonight is more of an opportunity for you all to sh for us to share information, to have a baseline understanding of what school safety laws are, uh, what we're already doing as a district, uh, and then from there we'll have a common understanding and then we can move forward as a, as a town uh, to improve ourselves. Uh, so starting off with school safety law, uh, we are regulated to have 15 drills uh, every single year at every single school. Uh, where two of them have to be lockdowns, two of them have to be evacuations, and 11 have to be egress or fire drills. Uh, one out of every four uh, has to be considered what is called obstructed, uh, so that you will use multiple uh, avenues of egress. So one classroom has a designated area to uh, leave, a leave the building, and if that's blocked for whatever reason, if it's a fire or uh, restricted, then you can go to a secondary route out of the building. <clears throat> all principals of each building are in charge of their building at all times, and they are the head safety person of the school. In the event that not all drills are completed, uh, the principal is held accountable by the state and fined $500 minimum uh, for, for every single situation they haven't completed. Uh, so the safety of the building is really rests on the shoulders of each school principal. You can also find this law. Uh, it's Rhode Island Law 1621-4, uh, so you can uh, Google that and you'll be able to see the actual law itself. Uh, also, the law 1621-23 states that every school has to have a crisis response team. Uh, so we, as you can tell, we have a district safety committee, uh, which I'll get into later, and that district safety committee feeds into, or each school's uh, school-based crisis team feeds into the district safety committee. The, uh, after Newtown, uh, the state of Rhode Island developed common uh, safety manuals, uh, which are also online. Uh, so I can show you what that looks like. So if you go to the Rhode Island Emergency Management Agency website, uh, you'll be able to look at uh, school safety online manual toolkits, and you will find exactly what we use. And all we have to do is fill in information that are specific to our district and our schools. Uh, and you know, you've probably seen in the news Captain Derek Bork, uh, who is the expert in the state of Rhode Island on school safety. And he said it best. He said, all of our plans are out there now. It's based on Homeland Security rules. Uh, so there's nothing to hide. Everyone's going to know what we're, what we're doing and what our protocols are. So you, we would list out our crisis team members. These are all the emergency contacts for news media. Emergency phone numbers for the state that we could call. Any procedures that have to uh, work with the media. Staff responsibilities by role, whether you're a principal or a teacher. What to do for an assault or a fight. Bomb threats. with the specific questions that a, secretary, a school secretary would have to ask uh, the person who's calling it in. And school secretaries have the most important job in every single building because the principals don't answer the phone. 
The secretaries answer the phone. The secretaries are the ones who are letting people in the building. Uh, so they are your first line of defense, and you should thank them every single time that you see them. And please uh, do not give them a hard time when they ask you specific questions. They are trained to ask you those questions, and some of those are new procedures that we've put in place recently. Uh, but praise them for the work that they do because they're important to the school function. Uh, for evacuations, if there's a fire in the school, hazardous materials. Uh, hazardous materials could be anything on campus or uh, um, any gas or odors that are coming onto campus from other areas, whether it's a you know, valley gas near the Ashton uh, School or, or it could be any of the railways uh, down here by BF Norton or even if it's you know, any, it could reach here as well. Uh, so that uh, also takes care of that. There's an intruder or a hostage. Uh, I'm sure that most of you remember last year when we were doing an evacuation drill here at McCourt, there was an actually an intruder in a home uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, so we actually had to activate our uh, reverse lockdown, which had to go back into the building and then go right into a lockdown situation, uh, which was real. Uh, and in the, in the moment, obviously, you know, a lot of students were nervous, but it was actually good for us to practice a real one. Uh, so uh, we actually learned quite a bit about that experience that we've put into changing procedures this year. Lockdown procedures, natural disasters. Typically, we don't have earthquakes here in Rhode Island. We have had floods and heat alerts, some severe thunderstorms, uh, radiological incident, serious injury or death, shelter in place, student unrest, suicide attempts. So these are all things that uh, are very comprehensively uh, laid out in this plan. So you can see it on your own. So as Do uh, Mr. Mitchell was talking, we have a, the Cumberland Safety Committee. The Safety Committee has been in place well beyond the last 15 years. Uh, before I became chairperson, uh, Captain Cohen of the Police Department uh, was a longtime uh, chairperson. He, he was a great conduit of information and uh, transfer over to us as a school department. It's comprised of two sides of a town system. So on one side of the table, you have municipal safety, which is the police department, fire department, and EMS. And on the other side of the table is uh, the education system, where you have representatives from each school and central office, uh, whether it's an administrator, a teacher, a teacher assistant, a custodian. Um, we have very important, the IT department is a part of it, the superintendent's office. Uh, so it's a very diverse group. We also have multiple schools uh, that are members. So we are partners with Blackstone Valley Prep, and they are here tonight uh, with uh, Executive Director Jeremy Chapetta and Michael McGee, who is the uh, safety officer for Blackstone Valley Prep, as well as Mercy Mount. Uh, so those are all active members of our district safety committee. We exchange information, we exchange experiences, and we've built a pretty tight system uh, for universal procedures within Town of Cumberland. One of the other most important pieces that we do is we review facilities. So part of the guidelines that came out uh, after Newtown was we had to conduct threat assessments uh, for each building. So we wanted to make sure that we can check on vulnerabilities at each building and start to address those facility issues. Uh, so I have done all of Cumberland's uh, with the principals and members of their committees. And I've also consulted with uh, Blackstone Valley Prep on theirs as well, uh, and Mercy Mount. So we have universal understandings of our buildings and their facility needs. Each school uh, has their crisis uh, response team. We have universal procedures that are in place that are based on the district safety committee's procedures, but they're also specific to individual school needs. For example, uh, we are considered a neighborhood school, uh, so if we wanted to secure our building, uh, it'd be much easier for us to secure a neighborhood school. It'd be much different to try and secure BF Norton, which is on a main road. Uh, so there are specific procedures that have to take place at BF Norton, and also uh, Cumberland High School, which is a large campus. Uh, that does go across a main road if there's an athletic event on a football field, baseball field, um, of that nature. So there are different situations that take place. We also, if you have to uh, lock down BF Norton, there's also 
close proximity of school, Blackson Valley Prep is right down the street. So you may have to lock down two schools in the same location. Uh, so those are all built into your individual school response plans uh, that are reviewed yearly. And they're reviewed yearly mainly because we do have facility upgrades that take place. You have staffing changes that take place. You also learn new information uh, based on uh, security procedures that are put out by Homeland Security. The school-based response team will then work with the central office team in the event of a, of a crisis. Uh, so that way, the, the situation that's at the site can then get support from central office. So for example, if there's a situation going on here, I can contact central office and they will be putting out messages for us so that we can deal with the situation that's happening, happening here. We also coordinate, obviously, with our municipal safety. So in the event that we had a situation here, BF Norton or Blackstone Valley Prep, we may call on Central Falls to come help us because they're mutual aid uh, and they're local to, close to us. We appreciate the partnership that we have with our municipal safety uh, departments. The Cumberland Police Department has provided three active shooter trainings for our staff members, and we are gonna be providing a fourth one uh, this April vacation, and we are also including Blackstone Valley Prep uh, and Mercy Mount in those trainings. Uh, so it's actually a live uh, event uh, for us to observe, not to participate in, uh, so we can get a better understanding of how we will respond to different situations uh, and sounds. Uh, and we start, to, we are able to then ask questions of each other uh, to clarify how things would change. Based on that training, we would then go back and say, okay, if it happened at the, our school, what would it look like? Uh, so we appreciate our relationship with the chief and the Cumberland Police Department. The Cumberland Fire Department has provided fire safety trainings at each school for countless years. Now they're regulated to do so, uh, but they also work with our schools to make sure that uh, we're meeting the needs of our students so they have a better understanding of fire safety, not only at school, but they can generalize it to their home life. Also, uh, our Cumberland EMS has provided CPR and AED first responder training every year uh, in our schools uh, and for a marginal cost, I think it was $5 uh, for our staff members. Uh, and we appreciate that because any way that we can expand our first responders training uh, within our school uh, base, we can expand our crisis teams uh, to respond much faster. Looking at procedural calls, uh, so you might hear any of these calls throughout the day, your children might come home and say, uh, we had a secure building, we had a restricted movement. Just so we have an understanding of what these things mean, uh, just lay them out here. So a lockdown, and these are in our procedures and these are based on uh, best practice and research. So I'm not giving you inside information. Uh, a lockdown is called when there's a threat or a hazard inside or outside the school, plain and simple. That could be an intruder, that could be an angry parent. Uh, that could be a student who's become out, outlandish. Uh, that could be any situation that creates a, a volatility that we need to secure everyone in a classroom and lock all doors. Uh, secure buildings call when there's an external threat in the vicinity of the school. That could be any external threat. Uh, that could be two cars that are pulled over on the top of the driveway. Uh, that becomes a situation, the police department will call us and say you need to go into a secure building. It doesn't mean you go into a lockdown because it's not specific to us. Uh, it's just specific outside, but we don't want anyone going outside. Uh, so that's what we would call a secure building. A restricted movement, uh, mostly they're called for medical purposes. Uh, so if you hear restricted movement, it's because we're calling in uh, help, uh, whether it's the ambulance uh, or paramedics, or it's just a matter that we need to move a student who's hurt and we want to uh, keep their confidentiality so not there are no students who are walking around the building we make sure everyone's in a classroom or an office we move that student to a secure location and we lift the restricted movement it's very simple um, a lot of its times students get concerned about what restricted movement means uh, we try to keep them as calm as possible uh, as routine as possible now restricted means doesn't mean no movement so if we have a situation situated in the gymnasium we can authorize movement in the other side of the building situationally. Uh, so it's just restricted. It's not none. Uh, an evacuation is called when an incident requires faculty and staff and students to exit the building and walk to a designated area. Each school has a designated area based on your location in the building uh, so that we're not all assembling in the same place. We, the idea is to get out as fast as possible into a secure location and then we can assess the problem from there. 
and then a shelter in place is called to move students to a designated safe location due to potential hazardous conditions outside of the building. So for example, if we have high winds and there are projectile objects being flying around in a parking lot, we might move a classroom uh, to shelter in place because there are things flying up against the windows. We wouldn't want the windows to be shattered and then come into on a student. Some various facility upgrades that have been taking place in all schools. Uh, school camera systems are frequently being upgraded and adding more. Uh, and those, there are technology pieces that are associated with that. Uh, and those technology systems are connected to uh, public safety. Uh, doors and locking systems are monitored yearly uh, to make sure that all of our locking mechanisms work at all times. And also so that we can simplify the system on schedules. So classroom keys can only open classrooms. Uh, so that in, in the event that we have a situation, we have universal systems for that. Um, we also have uh, FOB systems for all faculty and staff. So all faculty and staff can uh, wave a, their FOB in front of the lo lock. It'll unlock the main door and they can come in and out. They have access. Provides two purposes. It creates a situation where in the event we need to, uh, if a faculty and staff member resigns, we can shut their access off to the building immediately. Uh, if the, um, we can also track at times when they're coming in at all times. Uh, so it provides a nice check and balance system. We've added interior and exterior lighting for safety purposes, especially at night. Uh, we've moved to more of an LED system, which is more efficient, but also brighter. We also have developed controlled access points. So we've restricted the amount of doors that can be accessed by keys or by fobs uh, so that there are less opportunities for penetration around the building. Visitors are asked uh, about their business before they walk in the building. Uh, and they're also recorded on camera. And there are procedures to report to the office. And uh, once they get to the office, then staff members then have procedures in place to then control their access to the building. Reporting an incident, uh, one of the things that we've tried to do is uh, increase the amount of people who can report an incident, whether it's a student, or we typically get them for bullying and harassment situations, but we also get them for students who are spreading rumors around potential dangerous situations. Uh, and we have, obviously we would love it if students would tell us. Our students in both Blackson Valley Prep uh, and Cumberland School Department can email any staff member uh, to report an incident. Uh, but we also uh, have worked together on having an uh, on anonymous form. So, a few years ago, uh, Cumberland School Department, uh, through our IT department, uh, developed an incident report form. So if you go to the Cumberland School Department, straight down to the bottom left-hand corner, there's a link here that says report an incident. If you click on that, it'll bring you to this form. So it provides pertinent information for you to fill in, uh, and then it then gets emailed directly to uh, staff members in the Cumberland School Department by building uh, so that they can then investigate situations. Sometimes these are students who are sharing links to student social media accounts because they're posting dangerous information. So that's inform important for us to be able to see right away uh, so we have the credible information. Now working in, we developed this and then I worked with Blackstone Valley Prep on a anti-bullying panel uh, and I shared this with them and we immediately collaborated in Blackstone Valley Prep has a very similar reported incident form on their website as well. Uh, so. What I want to talk to you about and what the mayor has talked about and Mr. Mitchell is that safety is a universal precaution and sharing of information and procedures makes our uh, response to those situations much faster. One of the other important pieces that we have in Cumberland is we prioritize the fact that every student and every adult should feel connected to their school community and we're lucky to have Jim Field here. Uh, Mr. Field, if you can show yourself. Mr. Field is the PBIS coordinator for Cumberland School Department. Uh, and so every year we ask students to identify students and teachers that they feel connected with. And anytime that student uh, has any issues throughout the year uh, or needs someone that they need to talk to, we immediately go to this survey and we find those people that they feel connected to uh, and we activate that relationship. Uh, and it's possible that that uh, adult or that friend may be able to help us uh, get support to that student as fast as possible. Uh, so we do have a lot of pieces of information that we can 
use to build relationships within the district, which then creates a situation where students feel comfortable, where faculty and staff feel comfortable to report any concerns immediately and not think about, I'm not sure about this. No, it looks different. We need to report it. And that's where I have situational awareness. Uh, so there was a book written a few years ago by a profiler uh, who was from the Marines. Uh, and it was the title, Stay Left of Bang. So the idea is that if you have a situation across a plane, if bang happens, it's too late. We need to stay left of that bang and make sure we're paying attention to all pieces of information and data that we can then make decisions so we avoid bang from happening. Uh, so we want to avoid this situation or the incident and help preempt it. Uh, we are a one-to-one -one district in Cumberland, uh, and we have a system called Gaggle, uh, which is a human monitoring system. Uh, and that program monitors student emails, uh, phrases, words, uh, slang terms. It is updated daily, uh, and because obviously Urban Dictionary is updated all the time. Uh, what happens is it kicks those emails to an administrator of the building to assess whether there's a dangerous situation uh, based on the, the wording or the phrases that's being used. Now, this is where our relationship with the police department has been extremely helpful. Students tend to communicate with each other through our email system, and they share things that they probably wouldn't share in person because they feel more comfortable through, uh, through text, uh, which is our email system. And they use our email system sometimes like a system messenger, uh, to be honest. And we've gotten, I've gotten kicks at 12.30 in the morning uh, where a student has made a, a threat against themselves to injure themselves. And I've called the police department uh, and I've identified them myself as the principal of Court Middle School. I just got a kick on an email. I would ask if you could go to this house and do a wellness check uh, with this child uh, because I just got an email. And I could forward the email if I wanted to, uh, but I can just describe it. And then I've asked them to call me back uh, and they've, done, they've completed all parts of the process. Uh, and most of the time, those students are safe. Uh, they're just writing things that they shouldn't write in the middle of the night. But one time, we did have a student who was in need, and the police department were there, and they called for EMS. Uh, and EMS came down and brought that student to Hasbro, uh, where they were assessed and they were getting support. Uh, so that is how the system works. Without that system, without Gaggle, without our email system, we won't know until the morning, potentially, if that student was talking about it out loud. Uh, so there are a lot of precautions that are put into place uh, within our system so that we make sure that our students are safe uh, and that we are also focused on learning. Uh, so that's also a deterrent for students to use our email system inappropriately. But it is good that we have it so that we can help out and communicate. And at this time, I'm going to turn the program over back to Mr. Mitchell regarding future planning. So just a, a few more things that, that I'd like to share before we open it up to questions. And we have been meeting regularly and, and having conversations about some of the things that we can do moving forward. So for example, one of the things that we have talked about, we have a school resource, a school resource officer, Kevin Kolick, who um, spends a good majority of his time in the high school, but he also does, I know he occasionally will go to Blackstone Valley Prep. He also um, will make appearances at the middle schools, but the bulk of his time is spent at the high school, and I think he does an outstanding job um, as a school resource officer. So we're really fortunate to have him. So we've also been having conversations about the possibility of adding an additional resource officer, and that's, you know, that's, we're just in the, in the conversation phase, of course, some of these things cost money, but um, the thinking is that we would uh, potentially add a school resource officer who would share his or her time between the two middle schools and uh, some of the elementary schools as needed. So that is part of the conversation. We had a really good conversation about this uh, system called the Mutual Link, and it is, impressive. And the only thing that I could say about this particular mutual link system is that it allows communication between the school system, the police, um, fire, uh, 
emergency medical services almost instantaneously. And it, it, with walkie-talkies, it really is uh, an amazing system. And we are having conversations about the potential of bringing that to the school system, um, hopefully relatively quickly. So we've been talking a lot about responding to emergency situations, which is important. We need to respond as quickly as possible when an incident occurs. And we practice and train on a regular basis to do that. But one of the things that we also need to talk about is focusing on prevention. So I think we're really good at responding to situations. We need to focus more attention, not only as a school system, we are a school system and we have a responsibility to respond um, appropriately, but I think as a country we need to focus more attention on prevention. So we need to really pay attention to issues related to mental health. So as part of our strategic plan, there is a real emphasis on social emotional learning. You also need to know that in the budget that we have proposed uh, and has been approved by the school committee, there is some additional mental health support in that budget um, to help us identify those students who may be struggling with some mental health issues. And I think, you know, when we look at these awful incidents that have occurred in schools across this country, um, mental health definitely played a role uh, in the actions that these individuals took. So that is something that we talk about all the time. And whenever we can uh, prevent something from happening, that is uh, certainly the ultimate goal. And then there are other things that we are talking about. And these might not seem like major things, but one of the things that we're talking about is tinting windows. So imagine um, those schools that are at ground level we want to, and, and it actually has, we've already done this in a couple of schools, but we want to create a situation where, st you know, students and staff can look out of the windows in classrooms, but people cannot see in, right? So that might not see, seem like a big thing, but I, it, you know, it might buy us some time to um, take action to protect our students and staff. This isn't on the list, but we've also um, have had conversations, and again, this is something that it would be incredibly costly, but we've talked about hurricane windows, and I think it was the chief that mentioned that um, in this most recent incident in Florida, because it was in Florida, they have, I guess in many schools and businesses, they have hurricane glass, and the hurricane glass um, the bullets could not penetrate the glass, and there is um, um, some evidence to suggest that that probably saved lives because this person fired several shots from this AR-15 and the bullets did not penetrate the glass. So is that on the table for us to consider? We have a responsibility to consider it and hopefully it's, it's not cost prohibitive. Um, we have already, the, the school committee, in fact, has already made a commitment to upgrade the communication systems in um, all of our schools in every classroom. So every classroom will, um, in the district, will be able to effectively communicate out to um, the outside world outside of the classroom. We also are talking about in, um, providing more walkie-talkies in all of, we, there are lots of walkie-talkies already, but we're talking about adding walkie-talkies. And with this mutual link system, if there is an incident, there is an app that is involved and almost immediately the walkie-talkies within a building and the intercom system is all interconnected um, via this, this system, which is pretty impressive. The other thing, uh, the last thing that I'll mention is we're having conversation about vestibules. So that is, now these, are, there are things that we have to think about in this day and age that we never had to think about. Like when, you, when, when we all enter a building, for example, like we're thinking about, okay, if an individual enters a building, 
um, how quickly can they access different parts of the building, right? So those of you, well, I don't want to give specific examples, but the point is that when someone enters the building, many times they can just, they can go left or they can go right or they can go up a set of stairs and go left and right. So we are having conversations with architects about what we can do to create um, um, more of, a, of a, an obstacle, if you will, for people when they enter the building. So it would be, we'll have more control over where people are able to go once they enter that front door. So, and we're, so we, we, we uh, are having and have had conversations with architects um, about those kinds of things. So the, those are just some of the examples of conversations that we have been having as of late as a result of this most recent incident in Florida, and we will continue to have conversations. And, you know, I guess, you know, as a parent and a grandparent, uh, you know, and a, and a father um, who has two children who are teachers, and my wife is a director of special services in a school, you know, I, I, we all want to make sure that we're keeping people safe. And, and I would want to know, you know, as a parent, I would want to know that the school system and everyone within the, in the town are working well together to make sure that we're keeping people safe. And here's what I want you to know. We have a great relationship. We, um, the, the police are incredibly responsive. We have a great relationship with the mayor um, and George, and um, meet, we meet regularly with Chief Damaris and Rob Fay is, is in our buildings uh, all the time. And, and not just because of what happened in Florida. They're in our buildings all the time. So with that, let me stop there. This is being recorded. So if you do have a question, I don't want you to be shy, we're gonna ask you to talk into a, a microphone. So with that, I'll open it up and if anyone has a, a question or a comment that they'd like to share with the group, and we give you a second to think about it. Yes, sir. Hold on. We're going to give you a, a, a microphone because this is being recorded. Thank you. I won't be that long. Uh, jumping back into reality for a minute, uh, you people seem like you're very, very proactive on all of these points. The point I have to make is, the one thing I haven't heard yet is, according to your thing up here, uh, how come the resources officer hasn't met this nutbag at the front door and be the first line of contact coming into the school? That's my point. Are, are you talking about like the incident that, that, that already happened? Uh, it, it doesn't matter which school you're talking about, whether you're talking about Parkland in Florida, mm -hmm. Great Mills School down in Lexington Park, Maryland. Uh, where the okay, resource so, officer, by the way, did his job and took the guy out. Right. But uh, I'm just saying that uh, wouldn't it be to the advantage of everybody here if the first guy that this cuckoo nest with a gun meets is the resource officer at the front door? Yeah. That's what I'm okay, saying. Okay. So what, coincidentally, and, and I, I don't know if this was planned or it is a coincidence, just so that you know, in the, the, the school resource officer is located in the high school. His office is located right at the main entrance of oh, the- Oh, you, you don't have one at every building? No, 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 oh, no. Okay. But, 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 but there is not one in every building, but <laughs> I don't know if this is gonna happen, but there is legislation, just so that you know. I know that a, a, a representative from one of the, one of the um, towns in the state is, asking that there be a, uh, a school resource officer in every school. And depending upon the size, the legislation is, is um, recommending that there be two. So, for example, I think the legislation says that if, if there are more than 1,000 students in a school, that there be two. So for every 1,000, every, so for every, if the population's over 1,000, you would have to add a school uh, resource officer. So if that legislation passes, which I don't know, well, we'd have to have two. Yeah, of course. Okay. 
Just to add to that, um, <clears throat> it's a big issue right now, obviously, with the safety. And uh, just recently, I testified at the House uh, Finance Committee. We have our Rep uh, McLaughlin here. Uh, and um, we're trying to, as you know, the governor is trying to get a bond passed for a lot of money to help the schools throughout the state. Part of that, we're trying to get a good dialogue going with her in the House and Senate about safety. Okay, so there's a lot of issues that are out there being talked about. And with the number one priority I know from our town and through the reps that we have representing us is safety. Can we guarantee anything? No, we can't. But we certainly are looking at it and forcing as many issues as we can. Again, as I said earlier, is how do we protect our students? And that's one of our number one goals. Rep. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. There's just a few uh, things I'd like to articulate on tonight. One was a comment from the superintendent. Uh, the piece of legislation you, you're talking about is from Greg Amore from East Providence. I happen to be a co-sponsor on that legislation, put resource officers into every school. And the first thing they'll, they'll ask, you know, is where do we appropriate the money? Well, we currently have every year $80 million, okay, that the House of Representatives actually puts in for capital improvements. Besides the governor's $270 million, which is subject to referendum, which I hope everybody will vote for, okay? It's critically important for our schools. But the $80 million, uh, what my bill says here, basically, is to take a portion of that $80 million and put it into school securities for each and every school, whether it be resource offices and, you know, everything else. So if, after the meeting, if you have any questions, I'll be available. And thank you so much, Superintendent and Mayor. You're doing, doing a phenomenal job. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Appreciate it. Any other, any other questions? Yes, sir. Hi, my question is on, you, you spoke about school safety inside the school. What about outside the school? I live directly across the street. When those kids get out of school in the morning, in the afternoon, walk up that hill, it's incredible how many teachers and parents go up your one-way street, coming face to face with cars coming down. You have to see it, it's incredible. So you're suggesting that people are going the wrong way on a one-way street? So every day. Okay, every well, day going up this hill, every day at least 20 cars, if not more. Well, well we got the chief and the captain here, so we're going to we'll make sure that they I called the get chief's on office on Tuesday to report it to the chief's office because of it. Sir, you can call me anytime you want, and I will definitely be out there tomorrow uh, to check that out. In the That's afternoon. the problem. If you're out there or if there's an officer parked at the road, it doesn't happen. I've asked the chief's office to have an officer park on Morris Street and stand there and just watch what goes on. It's incredible. So, so the parking lot is not in the chief's purview, it's in ours. I understand that. So I, that, that is on me. I understand and I will that. take care of that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I had uh, two questions. One with the, um, the exterior of the building as far as, I don't know if it would be a security cameras, but are the whole perimeter of the buildings being monitored as far as not just the fronts of the building um, at school systems? You know, Mike Chandler, uh, our IT director, would be the best person to uh, ask that uh, question to. But but here is, I would I would here would be my response. And correct me if I'm wrong. Let me just say there are cameras everywhere. I mean, it is amazing how many cameras there are uh, in this district. So you really can't hide are there I, so there are lots of cameras inside of buildings and we're adding them all the time but there are also cameras on the outside of buildings as well and we have them in, in at, at every at every single school uh, in the district so there are I don't know that we're covering every square inch but there are a lot of cameras that help us in a lot of in a lot of different ways 
You had another question. Yeah, my other question was, it was great to see all the resources that are part of the plan. Um, just in seeing that, a couple other resources came to mind. Do you, is there any um, collaboration with any of the other vendors who might work with students, bus systems, aftercare programs, just to kind of loop in? They also have contacts with some children, not all of the children at school, just as far as how things are going, if they have any feedback. and. You mean, like, for example, with Alpha Best? That, yeah, that sort like, of are they part of the plan as far as, you know, any information, like reporting outlets, if they have any information or concerns with students? You have, you know, bus drivers who are interacting with students on a regular basis. So we, we um, are in communication with the bus company on a regular basis. So I would, my response would be, to that would be yes, we communicate regularly. They report things to us and, you know, I don't want to get into any detail, but there are incidents from time to time on buses. Um, there are, you know, one of the things, I, I don't know if it's appropriate for me to say, but I will. Um, there are cameras on buses, but um, I don't know that there are cameras on every single bus. I believe that there should be, and we're having conversations with the bus company about that right now. So that will be, I think, really uh, helpful. Um, and what was, you, you asked something else then. Um, well, I'm just thinking, you have, you know, Alpha oh, oh, okay. programs, so, you might have other, you know, people who interact with the school who might not be teachers or Okay, so I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, forgive me for interrupting. I, were you done? Um, we have a really good relation. Jenny Copens is the person who runs Alpha Best in the district. We are in constant communication. And there is, you know, understandably so, a heightened sensitivity with parents as well. And when security, when doors are not closed appropriately or doors are propped open in some way, they let us, they let us know, which is a wonderful thing. So when, and I, and I think people are more um, aware than ever of their responsibility to make sure that every door is closed at all times. So that's something that we can always get better at, but we, I think to answer, my answer to your question about the relationship with the programs before and after school, I would say that it's very um, good. I think we have a really, the communication is, is excellent, I believe. Sure. Uh, I think when you talk about outside uh, agencies that are working with the schools, I think the conduit between the student and the school is their family. Uh, so a lot of family members who know their child obviously the best will then connect our school department with um, those outside agencies that work well with their child. So in the event, for example, that we have students who have outside counseling, uh, we have procedures in place where a parent will sign a release and we can talk to an outside counselor to then work with our in-school counselors to best support a student. We also, have, for example, if a bus driver had a great relationship with a student, a parent would say, hey, you should probably talk to the bus driver or you should probably talk to so-and-so. So a lot of that conduit is with the family, uh, and that's where it starts with us. Uh, good evening. I'm a uh, parent of a student here in the uh, North Cumberland Middle School, and I'm impressed with your planning and your forethought and your look to the future. My question is, what is happening tomorrow to secure the buildings? What are you planning on doing in the next week, two weeks, month, to secure the building? Well, my, my response would be that the buildings right now are very secure. I mean, every door in every building is closed and locked, including classroom doors, by the way. Every classroom door is, so I think and again, you know, we're doing things that we never would have dreamed that we um, would have to do, um, that we, you know, are required to do for school safety. So I am confident that awareness is raised around everyone's responsibility to make sure that every door is closed and locked at all times. So I, I mean, I'm sure that there may be uh, an occasional door that may be um, unintentionally left open, but I, I think people are really conscientious, more conscientious than ever. Let me let me give you an example. Like, so 
uh, I hope this is a good example um, or a good response to your question. You know, one of the concerns at the high school, because there are essentially two buildings, um, ninth graders spend most of their time, not all of their time, but they spend most of their time in the trans building. And for anyone that knows the history of um, the high school, um, over the, the, the last several years, the, the students would walk outside in between classes. So they would move from the high school building to the trans building outside. Well, because of what happened in Florida, the high school administration and staff came up with a plan and require, they now require everyone to pass from um, building to building via the catwalk. Nobody is outside. It's impressive. And one of the things that people have been told is you don't let anybody in the building. Even if you know the person, you don't let them in. There is a procedure in place, and that's one of the things that we talk about all the time. There is a procedure in place, and it's inappropriate for me, even if I know the person standing at the door or I see a parent coming in who I don't know, it's not appropriate for me to uh, open the door for that person. They need to um, push that button on that intercom and state the purpose for their being there, and, and uh, then they are allowed in. So I think. I think people have been pretty strictly following the protocols that we have in place, and no students are, are outside at any time, for example, at the high school. Just to add to that, and I'll back up the superintendent, I had to go to one of the schools to read a couple of weeks ago, and uh, they questioned. I introduced myself as the mayor, and somebody came out, and I had to show an ID. So uh, that didn't happen before. Uh, I can assure you, I've been into many schools and all they did was hold the door open. And so everybody's alerted to this now. The other thing I'll tell you, um, that our district cars that are all around now, a good example is when the high school had that uh, day that they, some of the students went out, uh, we had probably three or four cars up in that area. So again, if, if you remember, we said communication is so important and the communication between the schools and our police force is outstanding. And again, we're very confident of being on top of things and that will continue. So that's being done every day, just so to assure you that, that, that we're watching that all the time. And I'll just add one thing. I can tell you one thing that we're doing every single day is that we have safety in the forefront of our brains as individuals for our students. And the most important thing that we can do is never make it routine. Because once it becomes routine, we become laxed. So one of the things that we need to do is make sure that we're constantly wanting to get better, that we're constantly asking ourselves, is there something we can be doing differently that makes it more, um, a, a, a much safer school? Uh, and I know I'm fielding a lot of questions daily from principals uh, and, and teachers about procedures within their schools, situations that are taking place. Uh, we're providing immediate feedback, and we're meeting more frequently about it. Uh, so I think to answer your question in a short form, never routine, always looking to get better. Uh, and that's the most important piece. Sir, you, yes, sir. Hi, I've got two pretty separate questions. Uh, one is I have a daughter who uh, attends community school, so I don't know the pickup procedures for other schools, but pretty much anybody can walk in to, at pickup time. I know you have to show a number on the, on the way out, but we're talking about throughout the day, or if it's 10.30, somebody has to go to the front door, but when it's 3.20, anybody can just walk in. So immediately after, uh, obviously, the Parkland situation, uh, your school principal and school, school secretary, Mrs. Vaughn and Mrs. Lucia, reached out to me. Uh, and Nidia Karbonik, who is also a principal on the safety committee, uh, went out and we watched your procedure. Uh, we provided feedback, and they're working on changing that procedure immediately uh, so that we can make that a much safer. Now, I will tell you, it will be less convenient for uh, the parents that are coming into community, but it's a minor inconvenience that might extend that pr procedure about five minutes. Uh, so I think that one of the things we need to do to make sure is that we have the procedure change in place, that we have the correct staffing in place, 
that we have the proper communication of the change uh, so everyone has a clear expectation of how that's going to take place. Uh, so that, that is definitely in the forefront, uh, and I'm sure Mrs. Vaughn uh, can answer that question more specifically to you afterwards if you wanted. What's your next question? Uh, my other question was, there's been a lot of talk about communication, and one of the things up there was mutual link, um, and there's a, an email incident form, but uh, most kids that are high school level and below use email very infrequently, and I know there are policies against cell phones and things like that, but, you know, in, for public transportation or if you take the train or something, there's a saying, you know, if you see something, say something, and you can just text to a number, and that all goes into a central area. So just from that aspect and from a technology aspect, I'm just wondering what other things could be done because a lot of times, you know, whether it's a, a student, a parent, a teacher, a quick, everybody, I mean, not every elementary school child has a phone, but a lot of people have phones. And it's, it's becoming more to, frequent. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so obviously, uh, we have an outstanding IT department, uh, Mr. Chandler. Uh, he also is a resident in, you know, he's very vested in what's going on in the district. Uh, so we're always trying to increase our communication, and one of the things that we have looked at is that uh, piece as well as an anonymous tip line. Uh, so th those are ongoing communications and um, planning that we're doing to see what's the most beneficial and how we can execute it. Because one of the best things you can do is you can always plan. Execution is the biggest part, uh, because we want to make sure that somebody's on the other end of the line uh, to respond to that need. So, um, so I'm a student at North Cumberland Middle School, and my mom's a teacher here at McCourt. And um, I was just wondering about the sort of lockdown protocol. In a way, we're kind of uh, the protocol's based off of us being locked inside. But in the event of something happening inside the school, I feel like we should kind of know a way to get away from danger and out. But we don't practice um, emergency evacuations we practice like walking over across the street somewhere uh, so I think my question is how can we um, find a way to practice getting away from danger because I know that in Parkland the students who were able to get out of the school um, they survived and they were safe and uh, yeah I wanted to know how we could find a way to get away from the school in the event of an emergency so those are uh, what we call and um, we talked about tabletop exercises. Uh, so essentially what we do is we work with our municipal safety uh, committees. The chief is there, Captain Fay, uh, and we would put a situation up on the table. So one of the first things we have to do is uh, train our teachers. And then once we can train our teachers, then we can train our students uh, because they're just as important. Uh, they're a member of our community. Uh, so those are the things that we need to, we need to prioritize school trainings and safeties as much as we're prioritizing raising test scores. Uh, everyone has to be a safe person, not only at school, but also be able to generalize those procedures potentially outside of school and at home. Uh, so if you're in, gen in general public, uh, you'll be able to figure out how it works at school. You'll be able to execute that out outside. So those are things that we're working on, Joe, uh, and is a priority. Oh, I'm sorry, Jake, sorry. Uh, there was a question over here. So um, <clears throat> I'm a, a parent of a six-year-old boy at community kindergarten students. So um, I applaud all of you for holding this session to begin with. Um, I don't know of other local cities or towns in the state that are having these sessions. So this is great. And, and I don't think any of you uh, signed up to have this discussion when you elected to be a police officer or a superintendent or teacher, right? This is new times here. Um, I've got a series of questions that I'll rattle off, so pardon my, my craziness. Um, I've heard a lot of reference to Sense Parkland you know, because of Parkland. Um, I, I don't want to assume, but is that to say that there were, that we were, there was a major gap of procedures or policies or, or drills or evacuation drills or lockdown, lockdown drills that have picked up since Parkland, which is great, but was there a window of time that? I would say that we picked up when Newtown happened in 2012. Uh, and since then, what we've tried to do is hold on to and I, I'll personally tell you, this is my role as chair, chairperson of the safety committee, and I've talked to all of our principals. We have tried to hold on to the school community experience as, as long as we could have. And now that we've reached this point in Parkland, that we've made the commitment now to locking down, becoming more, safe, more safer in the individual classroom. 
We looked at it from an external perspective, from the outside of the building, penetrating the building. Now we're looking at actually penetrating our classroom. So we're just, we framed our thinking differently. Uh, and so it's also become an issue uh, nationwide. Uh, so I think that that's also heightened the sense of everyone's awareness. Uh, so we're seeing it since Parkland because there's so much in the media about it. But let me tell you, when 20, 21 people in Sandy Hook died, that was a big deal. Uh, and that was a, an attack on young children, like your child at six years old. And that was awful. And we didn't see the change in our country that we thought we would see based on that experience, that we are now sensing the seeing of it in the future with Parkland. And I think that's the difference between the two situations. Other, other than that, we've also seen that there have been 18 school shootings since January 1st. Uh, so all these things are starting to come to a head because the media stopped reporting some of it. And now that, since it's not going away, the media is reporting more of it. Uh, so I think that's the difference. I don't know if I've been able to help with that answer. Yeah, yeah in, in no way was my question no, no, yeah. trying to find fault. No, it was just curious, curiosity. Let me just add to that that uh, if you heard before about the live training exercises that we've done in our schools, this is before all this was happening. So it's been a regular thing, and uh, I know my chief of staff, George Stansfield, was deputy police chief, and how far does it go back? Uh, since Columbine. So since Columbine, these have been a, you know, kind of a regular thing. And in Cumberland, we continue to do it, and as, as it was announced, we'll be doing another one at vacation in April. So, that we're, so it hasn't just been triggered because of Parkland. Um, you, you've mentioned the District Safety Committee a few different times, and what I understood, that was a combination of uh, Cumberland Police, Cumberland Fire, as well as members of each, of each school, right, that are on that panel, is that correct? Uh, there's representation uh, from each level of schools. So you'll have not every single principal uh, from every school is on it, uh, but they're always welcome to come. We also have two school committee members, Mr. DeMonica and Mr. Fiorello, as well, who have been on the committee for a few years now. Um, but it's a committee of about 30. Okay, so where I go with that question is, um, has there been any consideration to, to open up volunteer opportunities for, for, for those who live in town that have uh, training experience and or work in the industry, that, the industry within security, IT security, um, security operations? I personally work for a large financial services company in the state, um, and I have over 15 years of, of security operations and IT and, 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 and building security experience. So I think those opinions, uh, could be worthwhile to that committee from, from various folks, as well as walkthroughs of buildings, uh, different sets of eyes on, on, on new spaces, uh, I think opens up a lot, of, a lot of things. I know that was a discussion uh, at the school committee meeting about a month ago. Uh, we haven't uh, looked at parents yet uh, or community members uh, because of confidential nature of some of that. So having many people walk buildings and be exposed to uh, confidential areas of a building or network systems, uh, so we're, we're still trying to protect those areas first um, before we start vetting in that area. Yeah. So we're not there yet. Okay. And, and to that point, we talked, about, um, talked a lot about the perimeter, and, and the superintendent spoke of uh, the vestibules, right? And, and how, do we, how, do we, how do we deter someone or force someone one direction or another direction? Um, please don't just focus on the vestibules, right? It's, 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 it's every entry point to that building where you need securities in depth beyond that first door. So if, if an individual can penetrate that first door, whether it was propped or they're able to penetrate it, you need to have something else in the way to stop them. And if it drops, if it drops you into to a stairwell to multiple floors, keeping in mind of fire codes, but those, that next layer of doors should be secured and protected where you can. So when it comes to any time we're trying to do construction in a building, uh, we're looking at uh, architects who are helping, who are experts in those industries uh, and they do assessments of our buildings, and they look at those very type of things that you're talking about. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that's something I'd like to bring to your attention, and it was well, brought to my attention Sunday. I attended the rally up at the State House just to listen to the children, and I had conversations, and a couple of them expressed to me, uh, you know, the lockdowns are great, uh, security inside the schools are great, but the outside perimeter of your schools, okay, when they get on the bus, okay, 
uh, usually loaded and unloaded, that outside perimeter should be secure in some uh, fashion. That was brought to my attention. I'd just like to share that with you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Yeah, I'm back again. Uh, Welcome. <laughs> uh, what I'd like to impress upon you people is that we could make all the gun laws in the world, okay? None of them are going to work, and I'll tell you why. Because up until this time, since the early 60s, we've had gun law after gun law after gun law. The crooks and the nuts aren't going to pay any attention to any of them anyway, so you're wasting your breath there. So we've got to find another way to do it. Uh, Jimmy McLaughlin is at the State House all the time. And he'll tell you, you walk into the Capitol building, the first thing you run into is a recess officer with a scanner right there. You run all your junk through the scanner before you can even get into the state house. Unfortunately, I'm afraid that's the way the schools are going to have to go to someday. I don't want to see it, but hey, what can you do? You've got to protect the kids somehow. Yep, so we make it our job every single day to, to protect our students and... Also, our staff members. We want to make sure that our staff members make it home every That's single right. night. Uh, so, we're, obviously, as a state, we're looking at those options, and we do have great representatives at the state house who are in leadership roles. Uh, so, we're counting on them to be able to communicate with us the things that are going on at the state house and the discussions, and also allowing us to be able to work with them to make it sure that those things happen. Spaten. Yeah, I have a question uh, as a parent of a child in your high school and in uh, North Carolina Middle School. Uh, the, the walkout that was staged a few weeks ago uh, for the Parkland shooting, um, how does participating in such a walkout ensure safety of students when we're taking students out of a building that we're working so hard to protect them while they're in the building? Second question in course uh, correlating with that is, uh, David Hogg from Parkland School is planning another student walkout in the near future, and I'm wondering if Cumberland school systems are going to participate, and if so, why? Oh, the, the answer to your second question is I don't know anything about the, the, uh, the, the next planned walkout. There has been no conversation um, about that. Regarding the uh, march... It's been stated on the social media accounts. It's, it's been stated on his social media accounts. Okay, in the district? No, no, publicly oh, okay. on his Twitter. Well, yeah, Feed. we we um, we don't you know I'm I'm not expecting that um, that we'll be involved in that. But if we get wind of it, and we will, if there's any um, possibility that something like that may happen, I mean I think students are really good about um, letting us know regarding the March 17th uh, walkout. You know there were we had a decision to make uh, as a school system, and that was whether or not we were going to uh, support students um, taking part in this national event. And our position was that we would um, certainly uh, not endorse the event. However, we took the position that if students um, presented themselves in a respectful and responsible way, in a non-political way, that they would not be issued a consequence. So there were several meetings where students had to share with the administration uh, their plan for that particular day. And included in that planning process, because we were concerned that, you know, X number of students walking out of the building at 10 o'clock, everyone knew that it was 10 o'clock on March 17th, that the single most important priority was safety. And the police were actively involved in the planning process. We had several meetings. And the location um, where it actually took place was, pr was probably the mo we were in agreement that it was the most, um, was the safest place for it to take place. And the students, by the way, came up with that location. And the, and the police were actively involved and present uh, as well. So, I think all in all, because of the significant amount of planning that took place for that particular day, you know, I think we were all confident that, and we were all out there, uh, we were confident that 
that it would be uh, an event that was respectful and safe for our students and staff because there were lots and lots of adults out there as well and police. One follow-up question. Uh, I respect completely that you want to listen to your students, but why was the decision making so much in the students' hands themselves when you folks up here have been telling us tonight how many decisions you make for their safety and the safety of our schools, not just in the past but going forward? Secondly, my two students did not participate in the school walkout and were in some ways, both of them, shamed by their friends who did participate in the school walkout. Uh, and thank you for supporting the students who walked out. I didn't agree with it personally, but what are we doing to support the children who decide to stay inside and not participate in such events? Well, I certainly can't comment on, you know, the students who may have said uh, something inappropriate to your children. I mean, that is totally unacceptable. Um, I just, here is my, I guess I'm going to share my personal feeling about what's happening in this country. In my view, adults are not doing anything to make a positive change in this country. I believe that kids are making a difference. They're the ones that are getting people's attention. And I'll be honest with you, thank God they're doing it because finally people are paying attention. That's what it's going to take. So listen, we, we can, I respect your opinion. And we made sure that we respected the students who didn't want to participate on that day. But something's got to happen in this country. Something's got to happen. Too many kids are dying and too many adults are dying. So um, if this makes a difference, and I think the momentum, I think there's, there's a positive momentum and, and, and things uh, will happen. But it's never, it's never appropriate for anybody to, made, to be made to feel badly because they didn't uh, participate and I'm sorry that that happened to your children. So I think at this point, uh, if there's any other specific questions, uh, we, we have, we're going to make ourselves available up front here. Um, but this will probably conclude the uh, program for tonight. And if there are any other follow-up questions, you can always ask the superintendent's office uh, or the mayor's office uh, regarding anything regarding school safety. I just want to say one thing. Sure. I just want to say one really important thing that I say all the time, and that is um, good for all of you for coming this evening, because the easy thing to do is to do nothing. So just the fact that you're here and you're interested, I think, means a lot. So thank you all um, for being present this evening. And thank you, and have a great night. <laughs>